Thank you very much, uh, Katarina, for these uh, kind words of uh, welcome and introduction. Uh, it is an immense pleasure uh, to be here, to be here again. Uh, it's, it's a place that means a lot to me, and it was important in my own intellectual development. So um, uh, this is not uh, uh, a rhetoric um, device I'm using here. Um, and of course, I'm very sorry to um, disturb your uh, postprandial nap. I hope it will not be uh, too uh, disturbing. Uh, actually, I'll do my best to lull you in. Um, it is also, I have to apologize for only coming almost to my own talk. This is something uh, I, I hate, uh, but uh, s uh, the reason for it is partly due to some new institutional responsibilities Katarina was hinting at, and partly uh, due to uh, the National German Railway. The organizers of this conference, let me start without further ado, have uh, decided to beautifully leave the title of this event untranslated, Schalten und Walten. Uh, and this slightly old-fashioned uh, expression taken most literally actually summarizes like no other, I believe, the pervasiveness of cultural techniques. Schalten as the push and pull process which it etymologically implies and which we find in the vertical lids that open and close at public counters of administration, the shelter, but of course also um, uh, the switches of electric circuits and not to mention the serendipity of this felicitous moment when we finally get it, shelter. But then of course also walten, um, a word, a verb uh, favored by Heidegger, uh, das Walten, das uh, Seins, uh, the holding sway of being, uh, refers to a certain form of control, the root of which can be found in words such as Gewalt, uh, power, violence, but also Verwaltung, administration. Switching and controlling or to stick to the original Schalten und Walten, das, which despite a somewhat archaic connotation, constitute dominant form of organization of our present time. In a premonitory article, uh, post uh, scriptum des sociétés de contrôle, uh, Gilles Deleuze announced the arrival uh, of a new form of society, a form of society he called the societies of control. Drawing on Foucault's categorizations, Deleuze distinguishes between a sovereign power and a disciplinary power, but announces uh, with Foucault's own terminology, uh, or at least uh, in part, um, but also taking it substantially further, a new form of society, he uh, christens the society of control. Disciplinary power, a social technology based of, on confinement and on sanction, is superseded, he argues, by control, a technology that refuses the sanctioning mechanism of discipline while favoring self-steering. Societies of control know now no outside. Um, they are all imminently uh, organized, uh, whereas disciplinary societies are defined through distinct castings, controlled societies uh, are inherently fluid, as it were. While the former are based on rigid molds, the latter function through modulation, a self-transmuting molding, which would be perpetually morph morphing from one movement to the next, like a sieve whose mesh varies from one point to another. So in the new forms uh, of, of, of controlled societies, the factory has given way to the enterprise. The top-down repression is abandoned to the benefit of a far more efficient self-control by the individual herself. Farewell thus to the society which defines its identity through the position of a negative exterior. The new managerial existence internalizes and makes use of these small differences. From the society of restriction, we have moved on to a society of optimization. What Deleuze describes here as societies of control actually comes rather close to the conception of cybernetic organization. And this concept, this connection has been uh, drawn by uh, Deleuze himself, not in this famous postscript, but in, in another text, a conversation he uh, had with Tony Negri, which was published um, as Control and uh, Becoming, Control et Devenir. And in this conversation, he compares the three kinds of society to specific forms of machines. Sovereign societies, he asserts, correspond to, I quote, simple mechanical machines. 
disciplinary societies to thermodynamic machines and control societies to cybernetic machines and computers. It is not so much a question of generalized deregulation as of replacing the logic of a rule-based behaviorism with the logic of meta-regulation. Each singularity is conceived as already porous, open potential crossed by flows. It is these flows and their intensities that must be managed in order to strengthen them as much as possible. Kevin Kelly, one of the uh, authors of the, the, the Bibles of Connected, Intelligent, uh, Connected Intelligence, a book uh, entitled, Out of, titled Out of Control, considers that these new forms of organization allow considera considera considerably more efficiency uh, in control. A type of control that uh, would come close to the type of control already described in the old Chinese Tao Te King by Lao Tse. Uh, there's an interesting passage in the Tao Te Ching. Um, intelligent control, this is Lao Tse now, intelligent control appears as not control or freedom. And for this reason, it is genuinely intelligent control. Not intelligent control looks like an external domination. And for that reason, it's really non-intelligent control. Intelligent control exerts influence without having the appearance of it. The non-intelligent control ties to influence by making show of strength. And of course, this was Lao Tse. Of course, I have no competence whatsoever to decide whether this is an appropriate translation and whether the, uh, what, what the Chinese signs for uh, co translated as control are. But I find it interesting that we already find this kind of, of, of managerial thinking uh, in such an old text. And it is no chance that this text was used by certain authors of uh, cybernetic management today. Uh, the famous principle of laissez-faire, according to which the less openly power intervenes, the better things will go, traditionally attributed to the merchant Le Gendre, who formulated the expression in an answer to Colbert at the end of the 17th century, would have its origin in the first European reception of Chinese thought, and in particular of this uh, Taoist princi principle of Wu Wei, of not acting. In any case, the praise of the soft, post-coercive power based on internal motivation and on the progressive transfer from an external control to an internal restraint in Kevin Kelly, as in various other proponents of swarm intelligence, joins with the recovery of cybernetic theories. So I don't need to tell you, they conceived and imagined uh, in the 1940s by uh, authors such as Norbert uh, Wiener and, of course, um, John von Neumann, Cybernetics itself, is a project that was uh, shaped in a series of conferences, in particular hosted by the Macy Foundation from 1944 to 1953, to which Wiener was a key participant. And with some fantasy, one might even consider that this replacement of the line with the circle, the poet uh, Gottfried Benn had announced in the immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, when in the collection Trunkene Flut, Drunken Flood of 1949, he wrote, Die Zyklen brechen hervor, the cycles burst forth. In short, cybernetic theories update the program of internal control of any entity, whether organic or inorganic, technological and social. So what is cybernetics? Very briefly, just to refresh our minds, so from, from Kubernau, steering or uh, from the figure of the Kubernetes, the Kubernetike uh, Techne, so the art of navigating, piloting, governing. Um, we have um, seen this term entering the vocabulary of political theory. It is Plato already who uses this metaphor when describing how the statesman has to uh, organize uh, the politeia. The political world uh, is then uh, um, um, uh, assimilating this uh, nautical uh, metaphor, uh, the, um, uh, and we find this in Latin, for example, in terms such as uh, gubernatio, gubernator, of course, uh, it's uh, something that comes from uh, the vocabulary, the semantics of sailing. Cybernetics presents itself, therefore, according to the definition given by Wiener as a general theory of regulation. That's the definition uh, Wiener himself chooses. Just as he eliminates the differences between vital systems and machine systems, Wiener also proposes to abolish the differences between humanization and automation. 
It is, not, it is no coincidence, again, that this 1950 manifesto is titled The Human Use of Human Beings. So the, the whole point is, it's not the use of human beings, it's the human use of human beings. So what I want to stress here is that the, the, the promise, the almost emancipatory promise of cybernetics is not only to provide smoother processes, processes that work better, but processes that would be more humane. So we have to think these two things together and not as oppositions. Automation is itself tied to, process, to a promise of humanization. Um, so we're very far here from any fine kind of Tayloristic fantasy. Unlike the mechanical automaton, the cybernetic automaton is sensitive and reactive since it is equipped with feedback sensors. And uh, system uh, biologist Ludwig van, uh, van Bertalanffy has perfectly summarized the extent to which these two approaches differ. I quote, while the prototype of non-direct physical processes is linear causality, where cause A is followed by effect B, the cybernetic model, because of the feedback circuit, introduces a circular causality, thus promoting self-regulation, the goal towards, sorry, the direction towards a goal, homeostasis, etc., of the system. End of quote. So the cybernetic approach to regulatory processes is therefore, as evidenced by the essay by von Bertalanffy, directly inspired by modern biology. Uh, directly inspired uh, um, um, uh, um, the, oh, 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 let's, let me start differently again. Um, the, we, can, we can draw connections here to a certain kind of philosophy uh, of biology uh, which we find uh, in early French uh, theories of life against the determinist biologists who in the 19th century attributed responsibility for organic attitudes and changes to the external environment, milieu extérieur, for example, um, Claude Bernard, uh, uh, already, uh, highlighted the importance of the internal environment, milieu intérieur. So we already see in this uh, late 19th century uh, theories of life an internalization of the very idea of the milieu. In, 18, in 1860, he had been able to demonstrate that mammals regulate their temperature in function of nerve receptors through a modified blood circulation. Um, this is Claude Bernard. It is the fixity of the internal environment, milieu intérieur, that conditions free life, says Bernard. I think it's a very, very crucial moment here because we see that this whole opposition between a, a living being and the, a milieu that supposedly surrounds is, is, a, is a conception that comes later. Think of Uxkul. So the idea that, that the milieu is already something that is actually intrinsic or interior and has to be managed by um, a living being is something that we find here. So Conguillem then take, takes this up and defines his new conception of life as, I quote, self-preservation through self-regulation. Uh, and a true Copernican revolution, of course, because he no longer admits a categorical uh, uh, division between norm and deviation, right? So the whole point here is that we don't have a kind of, 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 of coercive order of application of a certain norm that has to be applied, uh, but we have permanently a, a readjustment. Um, so we only have relative degrees of uh, deviation. Pathology in this sense is nothing more than a failed self-regulation. Starting with Claude Bernard, the idea of self-regulation of the organism thus becomes central, and the idea is taken up in particular by the physiologist Walter Cannon, who since 1926 has made it popular with the expression homeostasis. He's the inventor of this notion of homeostasis uh, in a uh, modern context from the Greek homoios, so similar, and stasis, which is a particularly difficult term to translate, but if we keep it simple, let's translate it here as fixation. An expression that cybernetics immediately integrates into its vocabulary, drawing a formal analogy between maintaining body temperature or blood sugar levels with the self-regulation of the centrifugal machine or the Watt steam engine. This is why, as Georges Canguillem points out, the concept of regulation was only for a limited period a purely biological concept. After being developed within the framework of mechanical science, cybernetics borrowed it from biology and thanks to the mediation of the concept of homeostasis, applied it to the set of uh, systems uh, in um, system theory. 
but it will never be repeated enough. Homeostasis is actually the opposite of stasis, if we understand stasis as something rigid, fixed, and immobile. As you know, stasis is also the name the Greeks used to refer to civil war. So the whole point about civil war is that you, can, you can't do anything because everything is stuck. Very interesting. So there is no organic flow in the situation of, of, um, of stasis. So, so um, rather than being a productive force, uh, this whole movement is actually comes to a halt uh, in the context of, uh, of stasis. So homeostasis is very different. Homeostasis is this thinking of flows, of, of, of potentiality, of development, of growth. Um, so that undeniable strategic superiority of this internal management of systems had not escaped the emerging discipline of management studies. One of the pioneers in the application of cybernetic principles to management, Stafford uh, Beer, soon announced it, um, I quote, cybernetics is the science for the profession of manager. So Stafford Beer here clearly makes it, the, the whole point is cybernetics is actually the science of management. The axiology of uh, cybernetics, and I think that's interesting, is no longer oriented towards the figure of the line. The line for centuries was uh, the uh, uh, um, emblematic uh, device for understanding analogy. Analogy is the, the mechanism, almost the cultural technique, that Western metaphysics has used uh, for about 2,000 years at least. So th this whole idea that we are in stages and the small uh, echoes the large and uh, we, pro we, we proceed in, 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 in steps and in stages. We're replacing the figure of the line here with the figure of the circle. And the figure of the circle allows completely different uh, understandings of uh, collectives and of processes. From the great circle of natural, economic, technological, and social processes, cybernetic modernity is replicated in countless microcircuits of everyday life. Since at the macroeconomic level, production processes are conceptualized as cyclical processes, even at the individual level, life is now addressed in terms of life cycle management. Understanding and optimizing the process of self-organization and self-steering becomes the main object, object of business studies, in particular of works that attempt to bring human processes closer to solutions found in nature. So we also see this whole point that the, the, the project of a humanization of work, which starts in a Tavistock and Institute and from the 1920s on, so against Taylorism, is actually also in part a project of naturalization. So the whole point is to bring processes that are supposedly artificial closer to the essence of a human being. Marshall, uh, sorry, Alfred Marshall, who states that economic is not, economics is nothing more than a branch of biology, becomes a main reference again here in the 1960s and 70s with the following claim. Economics, like biology, deals with a subject whose nature and internal constitution, like the external form, is constantly changing. Okay, so we're not talking about eternal laws here. Economics has this problem that we don't. We cannot apply uh, eternal laws. And the recently awarded a Nobel Prize in economics uh, proves how problematic it is to have general modelizations. Um, and I think it's interesting that even the science of economics reflects uh, this problem in its own far too theoretical and, and, and modeling approach to processes that are ever changing. Um, so, if there is a broad consensus on the need for naturalization of the economy, Marshall's conception of nature within this new bioeconomy is still considered too static. Inspired by the analysis of the dissipative structures of cybernetics, the new bioeconomy rather updates Schumpeter's idea of the fundamental meta balance of self regulation processes. Regulation is necessary only where systems are open and entities are permeable. This is the quintessence of economic self-organization. In his best-selling book, Images of Organization, the new management guru Gareth Morgan evokes with regard to new organizational practices nothing less than a return to nature. Have a look at this book. It's fascinating if you think of the impact it has had. So the whole point is to return to nature and be inspired by how nature self-organizes in order to understand how to improve uh, um, organizations um, in human society. 
Whereas the Scandinavian or German social policies of the 70s and 80s promoted in the wake uh, of the human relations movement a humanization of processes, management studies are increasingly oriented towards the model of a renewed naturalization. The market must return to the healthiest foundations of anonymous self-regulation. And you can easily understand why this is also part of the whole resistance towards uh, external regulation of the markets. The problem, if markets went wrong at some point and there were crises, it's just because uh, they were somehow misleaded. So we should not intervene. We should just return to self organized market that works well um, and that would be healthy. So the doctrine of laissez-faire is increasingly present, which according to its defenders would be the most effective way because it's natural, because of its, it is natural of balancing the whole of uh, the um, market uh, processes. In the evolutionary economy, which calls for a combination of liberalism and Darwinian biology, the idea that free competition allows the same opportunities for all players in the market and at the same time allows the success of the best commercial product, product to be guaranteed is put uh, in the foreground. And at the same time, Keynesian uh, interventionism, for decades the mantra of economists, is increasingly uh, associated with counterproductive welfare. And then, of course, uh, we reach the 80s. Uh, in 1987, Margaret Thatcher uh, summed up the spirit of the time. I quote, The quality of our lives depends on how much responsibility each of us is willing to take on ourselves. No government can do anything except through people, and people must think, first of all, for themselves. Um, so this, this whole idea is, of course, a transfer uh, of agency, a self responsibilization of all the actors uh, in, uh, uh, on the stage here. And this call for autonomy, this call for uh, self-management, which of course refers back to Adam Smith, I'm going to say something about this in a moment, uh, cannot hide the fact that this form of delegated control remains a form of control. In another famous interview, Thatcher makes this wonderfully uh, transparent statement. Economics is the method. The aim is to modify the heart and soul. So we have clearly announced a form of psychopolitics here uh, that, that uh, works um, through an almost therapeutic uh, understanding of uh, self-regulation. Yet we have to understand how it works, of course. Uh, and I think it's not enough to have a look at these uh, neoliberal policies in the uh, uh, 80s and how they were implemented in, in various countries um, and especially uh, with the use of cybernet cybernetics we have ex clear examples uh, of, of countries that applied this uh, think of Chile uh, where, where it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a textbook example of the application of cybernetics to uh, a certain form of neoliberal management since the 1980s the world has entered the entrepreneurial age as Ronald Reagan affirmed one has to understand how this new phase distinguishes itself from previous phases, or if there are instead continuities that a genealogical inquiry can bring to light. And I'll come to the next section, the invisible hand. Every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest nor knows how much he is promoting it. By preferring the support of domestic to that of foreign industry, he intends only his own security, and by directing that industry in such a manner as it produces, may be of the greatest value. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which has no part of his intention. You will most likely uh, will have recognized a passage from The Wealth of Nations, 1776. Adam Smith introduces this influential um, uh, a metaphor of the invisible hand in order to explain why self-interest can guide social and economic processes uh, as the best form of allocation of resources. We find a metaphor here in an interesting, taking an interesting shift because we move away from a thinking of teleology uh, or design 
a lot would be to say here about uh, implications of the very notion of design, which is something that has a clear end. Um, but we have a, a development of a, a new notion of teleonomy. So there is a goal here, but the goal is not set, is not defined in advance. That's, that's what Adam Smith is thinking of. We, we can think of an organization that is actually a, a, a efficient and that has a certain goal, that achieves a certain goal, but we can not de uh, define the shape it has to take in advance. So no design. The best possible result emerges as if by magic without external intervention. Adam Smith, uh, as you know, uh, has exerted everlasting influence on the conception of human organizations and their rationale, but despite some partial attempts, I believe the history of the reception of this metaphor of the invisible hand remains to be written. Maybe you know of some references. I don't know, but I, I'm looking for a, a, a really full-fledged uh, history of this. I think it remains to be written. And it has recently been emphasized how influential cybernetic thought, uh, especially cybernetics of first order, has been on the liberalism of uh, Friedrich Hayek. Against any form of plant thinking that Hayek dismissed as constructivism, it is a matter of naturalizing all processes, first and foremost economic processes. Retrospectively, he notes that for a long time he was nearly alone in working on the evolutionary formation of such highly complex self-maintaining orders. Meanwhile, researchers on this kind of problem, Hayek writes in 1988, under various names such as autopoiesis, cybernetics, homeostasis, spontaneous order, self-organization, synergetic system theory, and so on, have become so numerous that I have been able to study closely no more than a few of them, end of quote. Where a rigid external framework is removed, a permanent readjustment of this to the circumstances becomes possible based on a feedback loop, and he goes on explaining, in the language of modern cybernetics, the feedback mechanism secures the maintenance of self-generating order. And he adds this interesting comparison. It was this which Adam Smith saw and described as the operation of the invisible hand. So, as you see, Hayek directly ties the metaphor of the invisible hand to cybernetic thinking, and this comes hardly as a surprise. Hayek has repeatedly acknowledged the influence on his own thinking of figures such as Heinz von Förster uh, and Norbert Wiener, uh, and was enthusiastic about the emergence of the new discipline, which also is concerned with what is called self-organization of self-generating systems. So from all of this literature, he takes the notion of adaptability, uh, which he places at the center of flexibilized work. The process of Adaptation operates, as do the adjust adjustments of any self-organizing system, by what cybernetics has taught us to call negative feedback. So the cybernetization of markets, he calls for, consists of a naturalization because it is a matter of passing from the order of thinking to the order of habituation. Self-government must be guided by habit rather than by reflection, he says. And early on, he had discussed the general raison d'être of rules and says this is actually a very early stage of development of humanities, where humanity still needs rules. The whole point is to get rid of rules and think of this self-steering process. Um, so we need to reach a society transcending the capacity of individual minds uh, in order to rely on the superpersonal forces which create spontaneous order. He says... Uh, pretty much nothing about what he means by these supranatural, uh, superpersonal uh, uh, forces which contain create spontaneous order. And my, I think my lapse has already hints at uh, my suspicion because I think that we have some uh, theological background here uh, that uh, has not been sufficiently acknowledged so far. Norbert Wiener is actually one of the, the key figures of cybernetic thinking that has acknowledged this connection with theology, especially in a book called God and Golem. God and Golem, uh, which he wrote uh, a series of lectures he gave after World War II. And in this book, he said, well, cybernetics regularly impinges on religion. And he explains how this comes about. It's quite a funny book to read, not very long. I can recommend it. But interestingly, he only refers to um, Jewish uh, thinking, of course, because of his own background. But I think it's much more plausible, rather than to looking at 
connections between the sensitive automaton of cybernetics and the automaton uh, built by the rabbi, rabbi of uh, Prague, the Golem, to have a look at Christian uh, theology. And for a number of reasons, I believe that the figure of self-steering is uh, uh, much more important in Christian theology and has been influential uh, on um, Western thinking. As our church argue, homeostasis is a directly heritage of a certain kind of theological thinking, namely that connected to the notion of oikonomia. A number of very important books have been written on this topic. Uh, I name just a few scholars, such as Marie-Josée Monzin, uh, Gerhard Richter, the theologian, um, uh, George Agamben, and more recently, Dotam Lechem, and many others could be named here. And uh, so I can only very briefly summarize what these, these uh, works in intellectual history have uh, brought uh, to the fore. Uh, what becomes uh, 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 quite clear is that we actually uh, have misunderstood uh, what we call political theology. Let me ex try to explain very briefly what this means. So we all have been told that actually many of our political uh, concepts uh, in, uh, in the modern world have a theological background. This goes back, of course, to the famous thesis uh, in Karl Schmitt's uh, uh, politische Theologie, so all concepts of modern um, um, doctrine of the state are nothing but secularized theological concepts. You know this famous quote, and this has generated a debate in Germany which was known as the Säkularisierungsstreit, so people like um, Otto Marquardt, uh, Karl Löwitt, uh, Blumenberg, um, um, and uh, even Jan Asman uh, and others have participated in that, and the whole and Karl Schmidt himself. So the whole point was to understand whether this is true or not, and to what extent we have, we are secular, or we aren't, or we inherit political uh, theology. Now, I don't even want to go into the detail of this discussion and leave you uh, choose if you want to enter the discussion uh, where you stand. Uh, 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 there is a, a number of possible options here. But the, the interesting outcome of the reading of authors such as uh, Agamben's big uh, analysis on, on economia and others is that actually uh, maybe we were wrong in, in thinking that political thinking only inherits um, a certain form of political theology. And actually, we find two different paradigms in Christian um, dogmatics. And we would be mistaken if we only concentrated on one of them. And one of them is what is known as theologia. Theologia is the science of studying the nature of this very being that is outerworldly concerned with the well-being of this world, the creator. Now, of course, this creator is a transcendent figure, and the whole discussion in political theology is, is a problem of sovereignty. To what extent is uh, the subject sovereign or is actually replicating or repeating something like the representative of this transcendent God? So uh, a Leviathan-esque thinking of uh, uh, politics is what is at stake here, thinking of representation. One stands for the other, and of course the representative of God on earth as the figure of that embodies this relationship. It's a, it, it's a thinking of duality. Think of the books by Roberto Esposito, Due, which wonderfully thinks, explains why our thinking of representation has this theological origins. Now, I think we would be wrong in, in placing this whole discussion only on the side of theologia, because what we miss is that Christian theology has actually devised a totally different logic of understanding processes which has nothing to do with representation and nothing to do with sovereignty, and ultimately not even to do with uh, a dualism, but has to do with imminent self-organization, and that's the notion of oikonomia. Where does the notion of oikonomia come from? If you have a look at Aristotle's politics, you will find this fundamental distinction he draws between the polis and the oikos. We moderns believe that the economy is the space of equality, where everything is made homogeneous, and whereas politics is a thinking of verticality, one ruling over the other. As you know, the Greeks conceived of it completely the different, the opposite way. So polis is the space uh, where politics are made between equals, between equal free uh, Athenian citizens, male citizens, uh, autochthonous citizens. And this is made possible by excluding, by referring back all the non 
uh, autochthonous non-male and non-adult uh, individuals to the space of the household, the oikos. Now, interestingly, within the oikos, Aristotle explains, we need differences. We need to take into account differences. So while in a space of politics, we don't need to think about differences of individuals, the space of the oikos is a space of differences. That means, says Aristotle, that the father has to treat his wife differently than he treats his children or he treats the slave. And in order to achieve, and, and this differential treatment is necessary in order to keep the unity of the oikos, the household. Now this very basic idea, which uh, might maybe seem as scandalous or preposterous to us moderns today, was actually a fascinating device for early Christian thinking. Why is that? Because early Christian thinking was faced with the main paradox, which is how to think the unity of the divine household. So it's an almost scandalous idea, if you think of it, the idea of the Trinity is to have three different persons within one household, and this household is said to be indifferent. So how to think the relationship that might and has to be differentiable between the father and the son, the son and the spirit, and the spirit and the father. All of these are different. And yet, at the same time, in order to avoid uh, the suspicion of polytheism to which early Christianity was exposed, it has to be shown that the divine household remains one and the same. So the whole point is to, to actually explain how these differential relationships are possible without putting to risk the unity of the household. And of course, God himself produces it. Uh, there's a wonderful text by Bernhard uh, Siegert uh, on the idea of the Ichspaltung uh, of God in Hilaris of uh, Hilaire de Poitiers, one of the early proponents, fascinating and undervalued uh, um, uh, author. And in this fourth century and then fifth century uh, theological discourses, we have very fascinating attempts to formalize this um, and to think of this flowing up and down, uh, uh, lateral and, and outpouring and coming back. And this is explained for the divine household, but will then be extended in authors such as uh, Irenaeus of uh, Lyon, authors uh, uh, such as Tatianus, such as um, Tertullian, such as um, um, Clemens of Alexandria, to the problem of the world. So how to make sure that the grace gets distributed? It's, it's a real problem. How to make sure that actually it reaches everybody, because not all of them are equal. The creatures are, are different. So do we maybe have to uh, make some, some twists to the, the rule of law? Might we have to use devices that are not acceptable, such as images? So this whole uh, uh, problem is because people are illiterate. So maybe we have to bracket the law which says we shouldn't be using certain images, etc., etc. All of this, uh, I try to, 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 to stress, is because I think that in Christianity we find a thinking of oikonomia that invents something that is more, more, more uh, actual than ever. It's diversity management. Christianity has invented diversity management as the attempt within a collective within an organization to treat people, treat individuals differently, taking their specificity into account and yet always keeping in mind the, the, the general goal. This is what managers have to do. Now, I cannot go, because I'm, I'm taking too much time here, and to all the details, it would be fascinating to have a look at how this idea of oikonomia also influenced early modern thinking. Uh, we'll find this project of oikonomia in a number of biological sciences, uh, Buffon, Linné, all of them believed in the idea that there is something like a di divine plan uh, in uh, the laws of nature. The whole point is to say that you don't even have to believe in the existence of God in order to believe into something like a divine oikonomia. So in a way, um, when cybernetics says, um, we don't have to assume there is something like a God. There's a God-like organization, which is the best way of organizing things. Uh, this is exactly the point why the thinking of oikonomia is an imminent thinking. You don't need rules. You don't need to deduce uh, uh, um, a behavior, you just need to make sure that this imminent self-regulation takes, uh, takes place. Um, let me try to save time here because um, otherwise I will not get uh, through. Um, let me just briefly get back here to uh, Adam Smith. 
the moment when this idea of economia reaches early modernity in early economic and um, biological thinking is when it connects with the idea of uh, the invisible hand. The invisible hand has different uh, uh, roots here, especially stoic thinking, which then becomes Christianized. Now, all of you might say, well, but this is far, far too easy. The story is too easy to say, well, there's a theology here in the background and we don't miss, we're missing the point. And to a certain extent, you would be right. Why is that? Hayek says, this is a naive understanding to believe that there is a maker behind the doing. And Theta hinter dem Tun, Nietzsche would say. And in, in a certain way, it's true. So this is what, what uh, Adam Smith criticizes in uh, early polytheistic thinking. He says there is a hand of Jupiter people believed behind uh, all sorts of natural phenomena. Yet at the same time, he of course uses the very thing he criticizes in an early text on astronomy in 1776 in his Wealth of Nations be, be, without, without uh, taking his distances. And I think that's the point of economia. You don't have to believe that there is an ordering principle, or rather that there is someone who ordinates it in order for it to work. So the, the, the paradigm of oikonomia, in a certain sense, outlives uh, a Christian faith. And the, the device it has invented here is something that we find here um, in, a, in, a, in a most effective way in uh, late modern organizations of labor, getting rid of the idea of an application of a law, uh, getting rid of the idea of a vertical administration towards a transfer of the responsibility towards the single agents that internalize these rules in order to believe that they are, have the initiative of the very thing they are doing. Karl Polanyi wrote in his great transformation, there is nothing natural in the laissez-faire. And I think that's the point. A lot of effort has to be put into devices and circuits in order for them to appear to be working smoothly. And I think this is where an analysis of cultural techniques becomes relevant today, is to see of how these things happen in greatest detail, this, the switching, the connecting, the feedback uh, uh, looping, all these kind of processes that, are, that come at a cost and that have their internal biases and that produce a certain a kind of thinking, a certain kind of acting, a certain kind of sharing or of not sharing. Um, and all of this actually, uh, I think, points to the fact that we still haven't understood uh, what uh, Schalten und Walten means, but one thing is sure is that it is probably no accident that at some point uh, the organizers of this event decided to take this word with all its archaic theological weight uh, to gather us here today. Thank you. <laughs>